Hi, this is Sarah Connolly, one of the coaches for the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Signature Program Project 90. I am taking the podcast over today to talk to a really dear friend of mine who works in the alcohol free space as a coach and counsellor. And the reason I've asked her to talk to us today is because she has a real insight into how alcohol affects women at the peri and menopausal stages of life. Now, being in that bracket myself, this is a really interesting and important topic, I think, for us to explore. There are so many women who are in their mid to late 40s, early 50s, who are starting to notice that alcohol is affecting them a lot differently, that they're not able to drink in the same way that they used to, And there are all sorts of other things that happen biologically to women during that time that mean that alcohol may not be such a great idea for them anymore. In the past, the menopause, perimenopause has not been spoken openly about. It's been a taboo subject. So I've invited Emma on today for any women who are listening and for any men who have women in their lives around that age to educate us on what it all means, what it's all about and how we can manage the effects of perimenopause and menopause, particularly in the context of drinking. And whether or not drinking is really something that we should be doing, that women should be doing in that age bracket and in that stage of life. Because certainly in my experience, the alcohol really started to affect me differently once I got into that late 40s stage. And certainly now I'm so grateful that it doesn't play a part in my life anymore. So before we get into that with Emma, just a reminder that you can pick up a copy of the Alcohol Freedom Formula. It's a free PDF that James has put together with all his top secret tips and ideas on how to navigate life alcohol free. And it's available for download at alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash guide. If you are interested in exploring the Project 90 program and joining a group of like-minded people who are all interested in improving their lives without alcohol, then you can schedule a call with one of our top coaches. Uh, If you would like to schedule a call, all you need to do is go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash schedule, booking a call. You can learn more about us. We can learn more about you and decide whether or not the program is a fit. So. Let's get into it. So welcome, Emma. I'm so, so grateful for you taking the time to join us today. Um, As I mentioned before, Emma is a counsellor and a coach, and she works specifically with women in their their perimenopause and menopause age brackets. Um, Emma is herself of that age. We were just talking before the podcast about how we're the same age. We're both 48. We've both had a lot of experience with what we're about to talk about today sadly (laughs) we've been in the in the we've walked through the fire we're still walking through the fire aren't we Emma (laughs) we are we are um but uh what I'm going to do is hand over to Emma and get her to give you a bit of an introduction about her her story and what she's discovered over the years in regards to perimenopause menopause and the role that alcohol plays so over to you Emma Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Nice to meet you all. Um, yes, I I think I worked in corporate marketing from probably my early 20s. Um, grew up in UK and Africa. I had parents who were expatriates, and so they lived a bit of an expatriate life. So it's very booze, booze fueled. And we had quite a booze fueled teenagerdom. Um, but yes, worked in corporate marketing in Soho, work hard, play hard, um, very much burning the candle at both ends and just having really a life of O'Reilly at that time. Mm-hmm. Didn't have our kids until quite late. Yeah. Um, so we didn't have our kids until sort of mid thirties, late, late thirties. And after we moved, um, after we had our kids, we moved to Australia. Um, we decided to emigrate here from the UK. And for me, I think that was when things started to get a bit shaky for me because I'd had a 15-year career in a big corporate in the UK, came out to Australia, got the kids settled into school and 
I couldn't get permanent work here in Australia. I was having to get contract. I was kept mm. not being able to get more than a like six month contract, a year contract. Which, being my particular personality type, and because I was always wanting that role to become a permanent role, I gave one hundred and twenty five percent to my job, mm. which meant which meant that I was you know, and I'm, and so many women working women identify with this, but I was on conference calls at various times during the night. I had like baby under one arm, breastfeeding in the, in the cupboard, trying to pretend I was <laughs> trying to pretend I had it all under control, but it was all a bit of a schmozzle. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing. Neglecting everybody. Do. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing how we do that to ourselves, isn't it? You know, really trying to pretend that we are not doing all of these multiple tasks yeah. Um, pretend yeah. that we're I mean I used to pretend to be in an office when I was working from home because yeah. it was it was seen as or you know it wasn't the done thing to work from a home office you really needed to be in the office to have a real job that's right that's right and just you know you almost like you didn't have kids or a family at home you had to have a sort of veneer of yes <laughs> this kind of like sterile <laughs> life where you were just always on call and available like a little ever ready bunny um yeah, exactly but yes exactly so it got for me it, I, I've been running on empty for a long time I think and I think as women we do because our hormones really once we get to sort of child rearing age our hormones kick in and those hormones specifically help us be really good at work and be really good at being a mum and be really good at being a partner and giving all our stuff to looking after everything and everybody and that's kind of what our what our estrogen's there to do um we kind of run we don't we put ourselves last don't we all the time mm. we're always you know putting everyone else first not feeding ourselves properly probably drinking too much um existing on caffeine and adrenaline <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then when stuff gets a bit shaky and when things get tough, it it means we haven't got that much to, to fall back on. We haven't got that much mm. reserve. We're hardly ever sleeping. I remember just being so proud of myself for, for, for ne- barely needing any sleep in corporate. I'd mm. be like, wear it as a badge of honour, you know, like that, yeah. um, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I'm sure there's T-shirts with that on it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, and um, so for me, I was kind of living that life and then eventually, so I was high adrenaline, high energy, and then I'd got a couple of permanent roles, really good roles, really big companies, and I I thought that everything was just going to come together and things were going to start to kind of even out a little bit and I was going to stop feeling as stressed as I was or as overwhelmed as I was and that just didn't seem to happen and then eventually I had a situation where a boss came in they didn't like me these sort of things happen all the time Mm. and I just couldn't cope with it Mm. and I literally was so burnt out that whereas normally I probably could have taken some of the, you know, the behaviour that ensued from that situation, I just didn't have the capacity. Mm. I was just so brittle. And I think that's the other thing is when you go through perimenopause, and we can talk about this a bit more, but it's like you lose a bit of juice. It sounds really strange. It's like you lose a bit of your resilience and your bounce back and your and so for me I just it just sort of compounded my anxiety went through the roof I I couldn't sleep I was having to I'd I'd never taken Valium I was taking Valium to go into work I was drinking and I then I started behaving like the lady was saying that I was behaving in the workplace because my anxiety was so wild I just started to I lacked my trust in myself and I just completely fell apart Mm -hmm. to the point where I ended up in the foyer 
pressing the button to get out of the building, knowing that by leaving that building, I was probably never, ever going to be able to work in my career again. Wow. Because it was such a, it was such a, Melbourne's such a small place. Mm. Everybody knew, knows each other. And not being able to cope is very frowned upon. Yes. It's kind of like a we you can oh you can cope with yeah. someone yeah. being horrible to you. And, well, and you know, I think you know, that can't be, that's, um, and, and that's the not just the other people, but it's the voice in your own head too, I think, as a woman, which is you 100%. should be able to cope, you should be able to handle this. That's right. What's wrong with you? Why can't you do it? Surely if you work harder, <laughs> yeah, you'll nail this. And one, yeah, of the things so. that you, one of the things you just brought up, Emma, was anxiety. And I think it's mm. um, a really important thing to raise because I started also to get anxiety, which I'd never really struggled with before. I'd, I'd had depression, but not anxiety. Yeah. And I think anxiety can be really confusing for women if they haven't had it before, because it does really fuel that um, there's something wrong with me. Why am I not coping now? The self-critical voice kicks in. But the reality is that anxiety is a symptom of perimenopause, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. It's one of the main symptoms. It's one of the big ones. Anxiety lack of sleep, you know, sleeplessness, not being able to sleep, and mood fluctuation, you know, low mood. So so this was all big, going big on ones. for you. Um, this was all going on for you, Emma, at the time, and, and you, is it, would it be fair to say that you weren't aware at the time that it was a perimenopause situation? I don't think I even knew what the perimenopause was, and I think this, yeah. that's another, you know, piece for us to talk about because so many people don't know and and people are you know it is changing people are learning more about the perimenopause now this is getting a lot more um publicity but for a long time people thought knew the menopause you know because we're coming from a kind of very medical clinical medical perspective and people know about the menopause and that happens at this time and and, and what that means, in it, it kind of has these sort of connotations and ideas and stigma surrounding it mm. that um, that it gets from society as well. And I think certainly at that time, I had no idea the perimenopause was rearing its head, but I think that was probably the beginning of me guessing my perimenopausal symptoms. It just happened to coincide with the situation at work that was a perfect storm, as we, <laughs> you and I have yeah. spoken about before. Add and, and booze into the situation. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell yeah. tell us about tell us about the alcohol because at that time, yeah, you know, there was a lot going on. Um, but I think even if people haven't got a huge amount going on, and the perimenopause comes along, and alcohol is something that they rely on, like you say, it's one of those things that we lean on as a crutch. Um, what yeah. what are the changes? that happen to us physically that are then exacerbated by alcohol which previously prior to perimenopause we kind of can just drink responsibly I say with the little quote marks (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah totally it's um it's really interesting isn't it there's there's so many things that can exacerbate our hormones when we're going through um, perimenopause and alcohol is one of those things um, and I think it to a certain extent things like you know because there's a lot of knowledge around red wine and hot flushes and you know it, anything really that has that kind of is it creates an energy so it's a, a stimulant basically um, that interacts with our nervous system so caffeine alcohol for some people hot food sugar <clears throat> um and it, again it's very personal isn't it but those generally those type of um stimulating products when we put them in into our body when we're going through hormonal changes it's when we we suddenly find that where we could drink a bottle of wine and not really you know 
not really get too much impact from it. Suddenly we're drinking two glasses of wine and we're completely smashed. Yeah. And it's just having a massive impact and we're so hungover afterwards and there's so many things that it does to us in terms of with estrogen with the excess of estrogen that we have and our liver trying to process toxin and it's just a it is like a it really is a perfect storm for just feeling completely dreadful but also that anxiety and everything that leads us to search for that dopamine the next hit um, which will make us feel better for that short period of time <laughs> and then make us feel so much worse. And we keep chasing it because it's the only coping mechanism that we've grown to grown to know. It, it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. I think this is the key thing that, you know, when <clears throat> we'll go through life and we have our ups and downs, but during those earlier years, alcohol is the go-to antidote and for the, for a certain right. period of time, it, it, there isn't really a glaring downside. You know, there, there's no. a few do- dodgy mornings and maybe you're living yeah. a bit kind of, we, we talk about living six out of ten, but there's yeah. nothing, you know, there's nothing that really knocks you sideways um, in the way that, I, I mean, I speak from my own experience that, um it got to the stage where I was having blackouts, which I had never, ever experienced yeah. before. Um, and I would wake up with that awful gut-wrenching, what did I say, what happened, who did yeah. I offend? Um, and I think that's that starts to get really scary, um, particularly yeah. as a woman, you know, in your 40s where you don't want to be... <laughs> you know, no. out, out and about not doing things that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah. you know, it's very incongruent with, with the person that you are. Like many of That's the right. Project 90 clients, the women are in that perimenopause, menopause age. And yeah, they're you're highly successful. Like it sounds like, you, you know, highly successful, high pressure mm. jobs, managed mm. to survive. But it gets to a point where that survival mechanism and that coping mechanism doesn't work anymore. Um, yeah. But but what, what do they do? What, yeah. what what else is there? So t- tell me about sure. what happened for you. Obviously, you left your corporate role. And yeah. That so I left. The, yeah. Go on. Sorry, I was going to say when you left your corporate role, the drinking was at a, a le- an unhealthy level or a level that was really starting to affect you. Um, it had, it was, it was, it wasn't. It was more than it should have been, but it wasn't. It didn't feel to me like it was really, really bad yet. It wasn't until I left, and then I was really depressed and really. Um, it just really broken and there was a whole legal part of it as well it was just really a difficult time and um that's when my drinking really started to pick up and even though I was mending myself um physically so I started practicing yoga regularly I'd always been a runner so I continued running um started practicing my meditation and bringing those things in, started retraining as a counsellor, all of those things I loved. But I was quite broken by the corporate ex- the end of the corporate experience because I'd loved my job. Everything, like I loved it so much and I was so proud of, you know, the companies that I worked for and just so it was so much part of my identity, a bit like, you know, being able to, to drink pretty what I would consider well, which means being able to hold my drink. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was when I left that role and I suddenly didn't know who I was and I was feeling I just couldn't work out what I wanted to be, who I wanted to be. Then it just started to increase. And like you were saying, I'd be, I'd be out with people. I remember going on a holiday and falling asleep well, I say falling asleep, passing out in a camping chair, surrounded by people like fairly early on in the evening and just being so mortified the next day that I'd been, you know, out with a group of people and I'd just been, you know, completely not with it. Um, 
and just uh, little things happened and then it actually got quite bad in that I was going on a trip with some friends and I remember looking at the gin in the corner and thinking I'm just gonna have a swig of that before I go and this was like early in the morning and then I was like Emma this is not something's not quite right here um and so that was kind of when I did my, my mine was to do with my I think my big wake up moment was my daughter came in and said to me we'd had a party at home so we were very sociable um we'd had a big party in the back garden and my I was putting my daughter to bed and she said to me mum can you not bring wine into the bedroom when you put us to bed because it makes me feel really anxious and it's making me feel really unsafe and that that was my mm, yeah I'm living out of line with my values I want, actually want to be a nice parent that they're not frightened of or yes. made to feel unsafe by you know? yeah yeah so that was kind of where mine got to well, that's that's a, a really important thing to to I guess pick up on is that the children notice way more than I think we give them credit for. Yeah. Um, yeah. My boys are ten and thirteen now, but at the time when I gave up eight and um, twelve or whatever. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until I gave up that they actually expressed how much it used to worry them. Yeah, which, wow. You know, awesome. which is which is heartbreaking because mm. they were they were living with that without speaking up. I had no idea, yeah. you know. But I think when you're drinking, you're so for want of a better word, you're kind of quite self-indulgent. You know, you're you're focused on your Definitely. pain, your suffering, um, your challenges and and how to get through. And yeah, you become I mean, I remember um avoiding certain f- groups of friends that you know who had parties for for the boys that didn't drink or that you know I I oh, know yes. that there would be a kids party and there wouldn't be wine there I'd be like oh I don't want to go to that one yeah um, me too <clears throat> so me too. It, it's it it's when you really look at it through the through the clarity of not drinking it's, yeah it's really really quite sad has much control over us when you don't think it does at all do you at the time you're like well you do eventually but for a long time I was totally unaware yeah Yeah. and then you become aware that's the really hard bit isn't it absolutely that's when you that when the honesty kicks in yeah (laughs) you start being really really oh oh. (laughs) yeah (laughs) this doesn't feel quite right (laughs) and you know I I think (laughs) we we can laugh about it now but that that is such Mm -hmm. a a pivotal moment I think to Mm -hmm. really and we talk about this in the in the groups, you know, that you, you have to be honest with yourself before you can really create change. And for those people right. that are listening, um, it, it, it's almost for me was the was the biggest hurdle was actually being honest with myself and then honest with my GP that there was an issue. Yeah. And yeah. once I'd made that peace with myself to be honest and pe- and talk to someone it was like actually easier from there I think the hardest part yeah. was this kind of conflict this inner conflict that I had about yeah. this person is is incongruent I'm incongruent with my values that's right. who I want to be and yeah. I lived like that for a really long long time me too me too me too it was yeah right you're absolutely right once you it's that whole connection thing isn't it once you've reached out to someone and shown your underbelly yes. you're kind of <laughs> it's a bit things start to get better don't they it's like oh someone else understands or I've shared my seat my dirty secret <laughs> it is it's like the, the great but the truth you, will set yeah. you free right <laughs> yeah that's right yeah yeah so true so true yeah so so we've talked about um perimenopause and and my understanding is that the perimenopause can start and you know really for some people it can start in their late 30s so yes yes if we were to sort of give pinpoint some signs or signals that somebody was going into that stage what would they be yeah 
Yeah, well, I, I think the mind, generally perimenopause is it most commonly runs between about the early 40s and early 50s and can be, you know, 10 years plus. Um, symptoms people tend to um, notice, first of all, and tend to get treated for. So often you'll get treated for the symptoms without them being, so you don't kind of, we don't put them together as being perimenopause, but they are perimenopausal symptoms and those will be um, not being able to sleep. And they can be even like, I for ages, I didn't realise this was me because I get up in the night to go to the toilet quite a few times. It's increased, it's things like that, increased going to the toilet at night waking up a bit earlier than you used to do. So it doesn't have to be that you're just like tossing and turning all night. It can just be that your sleep's interrupted um, over the night. Um, anxiety, 100%. And I think, and that rage, you know, that rage that we get, there's yes. that we, and, and again, that's hormonal. You, you, you've been giving everything to everybody and your, 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 your nurturing hormone is depleting. And so you don't have you start to feel resentful for the things that you used to just do because that's how you are that's how we were built you know we were built to to give and nurture and look out for everybody else now this is the time for starting to come back to ourselves so from a positive perspective that's one of the other things is really about you know starting to come back to yourself and and actually that this this whilst it can be incredibly difficult it can also be a, a period of great crea creativity for women. Um, and yeah. so it's important to bear that in mind as well. But in terms of symptoms, they can be really odd things. Like I had, re I thought I had arthritis mm. and I was Same. getting all these checks done. Yep. It, Same. Yeah. Again, it's the, it's the estrogen. It's your estrogen going. It stops. It's your juicy hormone. It keeps you lubricated, keeps your skin lubricated and all sorts of stuff. Really interesting. Um, what else um, you can have? Oh, hot flushes, obviously, but drink, stopping drinking really helps those ones. They still, you yeah. still get them, but it definitely improves them. Um, what else? Uh, some people get heart palpitations, and that's yeah. another really quite an interesting one as well. Um, which, which can be sort of seen as panic attacks, right? So people can feel that's that right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Um, Night no, sweats. Um, sore boobs. Night sweats, low libido, mm. Mm. sore boobs is a big one. <laughs> yeah, and um, and bigger boobs actually. I've never had boobs yes. my whole life, and all of a sudden I've got these boobs. I'm like, great thanks. I'm too, I'm too old for them now. <laughs> They're not going to do me any really good now. <laughs> I'm not going to be wearing plunging necklines yeah. at my age. I know. <laughs> <laughs> a nice hold up bra. <laughs> yes but isn't totally it's, it's so oh i oh, know we're back it's so fascinating to me that um we're looking at things like palpitations which may be seen uh, or construed as panic attacks uh hot flushes night sweats anxiety un disproportionate rage to situations mm. so feeling a real sense of rage particularly I think if you have children and many many of us do have children that are at that um sort of teenage age bracket which also adds a whole nother dimension to it um sleeplessness challenges with sleeping early morning waking um gosh it's just a a, a bowl full of joy isn't it Emma it's like yeah <laughs> And you know, this is hilarious. I forgot the main one, and this is why it's hilarious because I forgot it. It's <laughs> yes. memory loss and brain <laughs> fog. <laughs> memory loss and brain fog. There you go. Glad that glad that you remembered that one. <laughs> that was perfect. It's like I rehearsed it. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> So, so for, for anyone that's listening, again, particularly for women that are listening, if you if you really if you recognise any of those symptoms or a combination of them, um, mm. it's really worth going to the GP and sharing. I yeah. know that historically GPs have been really there hasn't been a lot of education around how to treat perimenopause, but it's really worth paying attention to those symptoms because it doesn't mean that you're going mad I think many of us think we're right. going mad um, or that it is just a stage of life that we've got to live with 
Um, and it really doesn't have to be that way. So, um, right. Emma, t- t- what sort of tips would you have for anyone listening that recognises these symptoms? And particularly with alcohol in the mix, um, which yeah. is you, you talk about this kind of cocktail of, you know, yeah. adrenaline and cortisol and hormones and not yeah. alcohol. What sort of tips would you yeah. give to our listeners? So I think the main things apart from cutting out the those stimulants would be um, go to your doctor, like Sarah said. A naturopath can be really good as well because they can really focus in on your hormones and really work out where you are. Um, and then it's there's I mean there's there's medication that you can take. You can do HRT. You can have um, there's all different kinds of. Uh, mixes of those um, estrogen um, additions, and then you know, some of the some some of the really good doctors as well can play around with that a bit, so it can become very tailored to your individual um, needs. But in terms of things outside of um, the medical interventions, and um, things that are really good for um, estrogen are um, all that eating legumes. Um, the normal things that you'd think like um, healthy exercise, eating whole foods, um, anything that doesn't stimulate your body food wise and, and drink wise. And then because a lot of this stuff is about the nervous system as well mm. and getting like a lot of the things that activate uh, when you've got stimulants coming in and that create activation, they, they're messing up with your nervous system. So Anything that you can do, breath work, yoga, meditation, those are all things that will help your transition. But there's no, there's nothing wrong with, and I think there's the, the types of HRT that's available now are really, really good. And the things that historically, I think there was a big um, medical uh, report that came out, in, I think it was in the 80s or the 90s, and it, it they, they, um, there was a lot of uh, people came off HRT because it was um, linked with breast cancer, um, mm. with breast cancer. But I think my understanding is now that the way that they, um, the way that the HRT that they use now is developed is it's a lot safer and it's basically speak to your GP. But really, in t- my understanding is that in terms of of safety, it's 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 very very good now in comparison to what they thought was going on with it. And I think my understanding is that that research as well was a little bit off. Yeah, right. Do you know about that, Sarah? Is that? Yes, I have heard that. And my my GP um, had said that it's very different story now to what it used to be. Um, and That's that, right. The, it's a lot safer. There's They're not putting, I think there was some, some of it was being made from horse something or other or <laughs> there was some really terrible stories around what hormone replacement therapy was being created from but now it's uh biochemically identical isn't it a lot of it so the other thing I would add in because personally estrogen and HRT haven't worked for me but I'm using yeah. acupuncture which uh, yeah great so if, it, if you're listening and you find you have sensitivities to things like the pill or to certain types of contraceptions, um, then it may be that you have an estrogen sensitivity. So things like acupuncture is what I'm exploring at the moment. But I also love what you said, Emma, about finding someone that can tailor something to you because this really is not a one-size-fits-all thing. We're all so uniquely different. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is so important to find something that works for you. And if something doesn't work, don't give up because you don't have to live through this. It, it's, um, I know I'm in the thick of it um, and I know Emma is too, yeah, me too. Um, hence why we're talking about <laughs> it. And, and um, yeah. pillow, pillow screaming, that's one that I've been um, experimenting with lately. <laughs> yes. Um, my acupuncturist told me do some pillow screaming and it is actually quite therapeutic basically shove your head in a pillow and scream and (laughs) (laughs) everyone thinks everyone thinks you're mental but um it does the trick it releases it releases something anyway sounds lovely I might go and do that afterwards (laughs) 
Well, Emma, thank you so, so much for taking the time to chat to us and our audience. I'm certain that there'll be some people listening that will have had some aha moments because this is, uh, it's a real, real time of life where there's so much change. And if you're, if you're using alcohol, um, the, yeah, the reality is it's just going to make it worse. Um, hundred percent and worse and worse. And unfortunately for women, a lot more than for men, um, yes. in, in terms of the, the downward trajectory, it's a lot quicker I believe yeah. than it is for men. In there's a there's an enzyme. You're right. There's an enzyme that we have less of anyway, or something that men have. That once we get to this stage of our life, the it really really struggles processing alcohol as well. So yeah, and yeah. that's not to say that any men who are still listening, which I doubt there are many, but any men that are still listening, you know, alcohol <laughs> is it. <laughs> we we don't recommend it for anyone really, um, but particularly women and I think that the key message for me that's come out of this is that it's really about being kind to yourself that this is not you know this isn't a normal stage of life that you have to put up with and it's not a stage of life that you can anesthetize with alcohol unless you're prepared for really negative consequences yeah a really bad trip Mm. on it really is yeah yeah all right, Emma. Well, I'm. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This is Emma Gilmore from Hope Rising Coaching, and Emma works with women in their um, perimenopause, menopause stage, and she specialises as well women with teenagers. Um, so, if you want to check out Emma and what she does, you can go to hop, hope rising coaching dot com dot au. Is that right, Emma? dot com. Hope rising dot com. Hop hope rising dot com. And before before I sign off, just a a quick reminder that you can pick up the free alcohol freedom formula via the link in the podcast episode. That's James's free download for anyone that's looking to reduce their alcohol or quit alcohol altogether. And if you're interested in joining the Project 90 program, please schedule a call at alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash schedule where you can book in a call with one of our coaches and find out whether Project 90 is the right program for you. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you've got something useful from this episode and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I want to load you up with 